All right. We know the players that you love. Well, you know the players that you love. Who are the players that are going to be big this year? And perhaps yeah, maybe larger than you expected that and more on today's edition of the Audible C. Salami Sigmund Bloom with conversation about Atlanta. B. John Robinson, like, yeah. yes, Tyler Azure is there. Yes. Um, but when you hear that Robinson could be used like Christian McCaffrey Bloom, what do you say? Yeah, well, this is one where there's a lot of choices in fantasy drafts this year that revolve around the idea of how bad was Arthur Smith for the Atlanta offense or how bad was Desmond Ritter and Taylor Heineke for the Atlanta offense, which then you know implicates uh, even Pittsburgh's offense, depending on what you think about Arthur Smith. But focusing on Atlanta's offense, you can see in the ADP sees Drake London, fourth, fifth round pick last year second round pick this year high second round pick uh kyle pitts interestingly enough six round pick last year fifth six round pick this year says fantasy football music yeah you know i've been burned a lot it's got to so get I more touchdowns know. yeah so uh, b john robinson late first round last year mid first round this year it seems like b john robinson is after those top wide receivers jefferson chase tyreek hill lamb and there's a fork in the road. Do you want Brees Hall or do you want B. John Robinson in the middle of the first round? So, so, I mean, and hey, moving up from nine or 10 to six or seven in a fantasy draft, that's a big value leap. Those aren't not uh, trivial spots, but still there's room for you invoke the name Christian McCaffrey. There's room for B. John Robinson to rival Christian McCaffrey if the offense is better and he gets the role. Oh, check. There's the role or at least the promise of the role. Yes, it's offseason coach speak blah 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 but we know he's good enough to deserve that big of a role and he was drafted at least the investment to play that size role so yeah i can see folks even someone sitting at four or five saying be john robinson or bust that's going to be my fantasy team name this year yeah that's what it should be in bloom we know that the turnover at running back is so thorough it's 50 percent um all right, why isn't Robinson, you know, I'm not saying number one back at the end of the year, but wouldn't be surprising if he did. Right. With Christian McCaffrey, you know, there's always injuries as a possibility as he gets on the back nine of his career. With Brees Hall, you know, Brees Hall, I I think you can make a case for Brees Hall also to make that leap. We need Aaron Rodgers to keep the offense viable, offensive line health, maybe not quite as important with the first round pick spent on the offensive line. Uh, And then, Brees Hall was really coming on last year on you know, a trash offense, you know, a really, really bad <laughs> offense. It was terrible. So, the, but it's still the Jets. Uh, and Brees Hall still missing some sort of uh, OTAs for some undisclosed reason. You know, it's not comforting. It's not anything to be worried about, but you would prefer to see him out there. So, absolutely. You know, I, I think that uh, this is a, a choice right now. And, and, and see, I don't think there's really anybody else. Saquon Barkley, I guess. I mean, Saquon Barkley, because Kellen Moore is going to run the ball more. And it's possible that they could split up those rushing touchdowns. Uh, and then, you know, this is a, 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 a very good running game. So Saquon Barkley maybe could rival that. And I think that's the end of the conversation of running backs who could be number one. Uh, that being said, I still think you're seeing a wide receiver dominated first round because of how many times people have been burned by these backs. Yeah, wide receiver dominator first round, and things are much different than they were when you started playing fantasy football when it was running back yeah. for the first yeah. 15 picks. Right, right. Uh, so now we're digging through the leftovers. Let's talk about Brees Hall, though, because I know he's on this list, and Barkley was on my list as well um, because, well, basically he could get, you know, 80 receptions in addition to what he does as a runner. But Hall's there. You mentioned it. But let's let's um, unpack it, Bloom, Mm -hmm. because, yeah, and again, I'm going to sound like the old man, get off my lawn, but like, okay, Brees Hall is physically talented. Yeah, we know that. I'm relying on Nathaniel Hackett and Aaron Rodgers. I don't trust that. Right. Right, exactly. You know, Cisa, keep coming back to this very simple, very straightforward thing that occurred to me. We're kind of hiring these teams to deploy the assets that we acquire in the draft. Who are you trusting to do that? Who's your advisors here? You know, who's allowed in your war room? And you're right. Uh, as you know, as of this moment, 
Aaron Rodgers is not at a mandatory uh, mini camp. So Robert Sala, bless Robert Sala's heart. I hope his next oh, job is a good one. I hope it's a good one. Uh, Robert Sala says there was something, I think he said something very important to him, a prior engagement, important to Rodgers, that is. He had to miss, and he would be fine. Anyway, it just reminds you of that, Cease. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that Zach Robinson uh, and the bloodline that he comes from coaching-wise. And the other thing about Atlanta, you know, as much as people bemoaned that Michael Penix, worst pick ever, uh, now That's it's not. It it gives a lot of insurance for this offense in terms of function and quality, yep. uh, depending on where Kirk Cousins is at. So, yeah, I think you want to trust Atlanta. And I think that Drake London moving up from the fourth to the second round represents the fantasy football community saying we trust Atlanta. Maybe, the, you know, the Kyle Pitts conversation is an interesting one where the fantasy football community is saying, well, we don't trust Kyle Pitts, but I think that how you feel about Atlanta is one of the things you have to sort out going into fantasy drafts this year because it's very important. Yeah, it's going to be important to look at the Eagles situation and Saquon right. Barkley is there. So let's discuss that because again, 80 catches is not out of the realm. And again, Bloom, it's trust. Who do you trust? I trust the Eagles offense. I do not trust the Jets at all. Right. You trust the Eagles and I, I suppose Cease here's a proposition you tell me what you think if this passes the sniff test okay uh jason kelsey was one of the big reasons that the tush push was so unstoppable and because he's retired now that alone could and plus hertz has been banged up you know so they're ready for something different at the goal line does that pass the sniff test nah i mean i like jason better than travis but whatever i mean you can teach that unless he was doing something illegal. Like right. you can teach everything he was doing. So there you go. Yeah, well, and the question, because the question becomes if six, eight, 10 of those rushing touchdowns can shake out to Saquon Barkley, then he definitely has first round value within reach. Uh, maybe he's not going to be heavily used as a receiver, but in this offense, when he is used as a receiver, he can make good things happen. We've seen him make good things happen downfield in the passing game before. I mean, that's the other thing, Cease. Again, it's like there's two sides of this equation. It's how much do we trust the Eagles and how much do we think the Giants might have been holding him back? How much are we looking at the Giants as a situation where nothing grows, nothing really flourishes there? So, yeah, this is exciting. And I think with all these running backs, you, you know, if you're you're not doing a fantasy draft next week unless you're a degenerate, which is great. You're in the right place if you are. But <laughs> these running backs, you know, if you have the number one pick, you're taking Christian McCaffrey, probably. I could see people that wouldn't do that. If you draw a pick in the middle of the first round, you have to think about Brees Hall and B. John Robinson and what you think about them. If you draw a pick at the end of the first round, you have to think about first Jameer Gibbs, Jameer Gibbs is going right at the turn. And, you know, that's another conversation to unpack. And Jonathan Taylor and Saquon Barkley. You know, that's the tier. Uh, and I think they're all interesting cases, but they call it hero running back. And you're not zero running back, hero running back. And I think this is a group that is very much worthy of that hero running back label. You just have to decide which one because wide receiver is deep enough this year uh, that you're you'll be fine trotting out the guys you get in the third fourth fifth round and running back is deep enough that if you're number two running backs from the seventh eighth ninth round you're fine with that too you just have to who's going to be our hero cease uh, but it's funny because i want to circle back something you said that i think is, is really on point you know you think about back to the future you know, back to the future was only 30 years and i mean stud running back was maybe 20 25 years ago but okay. you can imagine in like fantasy football back to the future like jumping ahead of the future and listening to a <laughs> fantasy football and they're saying you don't you, wide receivers rule the first round what what kind of world what happened to make things change uh, and i'm just picturing doc brown like well we're going we don't need running backs yeah we don't need running backs but if you do <laughs> yeah <laughs> Look at the offense around him, and now's the time of the show where we throw off the gloves. I said, good day, sir. Um, I think Jonathan Taylor is not as trustworthy because I don't believe in Joe Flacco. 
Okay. And I know you disagree with that. So let's discuss this because if yeah. we're looking at insurance, right? We're insurance salesmen today. Like I thought Brock Purdy would be when he talked to me for an hour at the shrine game and he was like, I'm done playing. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Um, anyway, I think Flacco was figured out in the postseason. Maybe it's just Flacco in the postseason. Yeah. Uh, but Anthony Richardson is scary for both Colts fans and the rest of the league. So Jonathan Taylor looks great there at the end of the first. And then I think, what if Anthony Richardson gets hurt? Because he was hurt mm -hmm. in every game until his right. season ended. He was right. hurt in every right. game. Right, right. And then Joe Flacco comes in. I'm like, well, that, hey, that was then. This is now. And I don't trust it. Yeah, the Colts are an interesting one to dissect. Uh, I think that there are some things, there are some pe people we do trust, right? I mean, I think we trust Shane Steichen at this point. Um, and that is helpful in the event that it is Joe Flacco. Uh, I think when we circle back to Jonathan Taylor and the question about Jonathan Taylor, more than what you feel about Joe Flacco or how this offense could be without Anthony Richardson. And the point you're making about Richardson is one that we should pause and give a little bit of air to like, I mean, if Anthony Richardson gets hurt in game two, game three, you know, in September, misses significant time or suffers multiple injuries or otherwise is a disappointment because of injuries. And it will seem like, well, why did we ever convince ourselves of anything else? And, you know, uh, of course, if he has a healthy season, then we may leave this in the rearview mirror. We'll see. But that definitely makes this offense a little more precarious. And Cease, you might even say that the Colts went out and got Flacco is some sort of evidence that they're saying, well, we need to, we can't just be satisfied with Sudfeld or something. You know, we have to have just, I mean, Flacco got the Browns to the playoffs. If you said, who can get this team to the playoffs that's <laughs> out there if we lose our starter? I mean, he just did it last year. So mm -hmm. it shows what's on their mind. So I think it's, you're, you're right to bring that up. Um, but I, the main pause with Jonathan Taylor is well if you don't like the eagles running backs because of the tush push if you, that makes you out on saquon barkley or lukewarm then it sure looks like anthony richardson is is going to bogart the touchdowns in the red zone on the ground uh and don't know what jonathan taylor is going to get in terms of that he just hasn't looked like the running back two years ago it was taylor or mccaffrey it was a debate it was an actual debate at the top of fantasy drafts taylor or mccaffrey and now Taylor's in, available in the early second. And we're like, yeah, because he didn't look like that Jonathan Taylor coming back off of the ankle last year. And while Anthony Richardson and Shane Steichen should create a, at least an environment conducive to very efficient offense. I mean, since we haven't even talked about uh, A.D. Mitchell, Josh Downs, like the speed, the vertical element, how that helps the job of Anthony Richardson and Shane Steichen and, and Jonathan Taylor. Uh, but you're right to, to point out that this is still an offense at its uh, essence that is fragile until Anthony Richardson proves he can stay on the field. Yeah, let's talk about 2,000 yards for a receiver because I think C.D. Lamb could do it. Uh, and I was writing about Cooper Cup on our Football Guys Newswire. Make sure to like and comment, subscribe and share this video uh, and make sure to check out footballguys.com for that free daily newsletter. So I was writing about Cooper Cup and, you know, his status and the news about him or whatever. And just looking back at that magical, damn near 2,000-yard receiving season, we don't mm -hmm. we don't see it that often. I think C.D. Lamb, and you've mentioned it before on this show, like Dak Prescott's going to have to do everything. <laughs> so right. if Dak is doing everything, C.D.'s going to get two. So yeah. you're, hey, number one overall pick, number one overall pick, C.D. Lamb. Yeah. Prove me wrong. Yeah. Well, Cease, I think that, and again, this is just the lens of how I see fantasy drafts. You may find it compelling. You may not. But... I look at the Dallas offense last year, and I think what's relevant is from the buy forward. And that's when those geniuses, Brian Schottenheimer and Mike McCarthy, made the <laughs> adjustment. I know. The, you know, let it humble us every year. Every year we come back and get humbled again and again and again by doing this thing where we pretend that we can predict the future because, indeed, that actually is an accurate statement. You know, the most, for fantasy football, the most consequential by week adjustments by far came out of dallas mm -hmm. and in an oversimplified way it was just more dac more cd and it was beautiful and it helped everybody i mean brandon cooks had some big games jake yep. ferguson was a more consistent player uh so 
you could then add, you compound this this year with Rico Dowdle and Ezekiel Elliott as your lead running backs. So whatever inclinations you might have had to have a balanced offense, I think that notion is going to get dispelled pretty quickly. You know, Zeke showed that at least he's a, I mean, look, Zeke is a, he's a classic third running back. I mean, you love at this stage of his career, you love to have an Ezekiel Elliott as your third running back. He can like, like the Kansas city chiefs should want to have Zeke as their third running back, right? He can pass block. He can catch out of the backfield. He's at least a competent running back. You know, he's been there, done that, but he doesn't add anything anymore. He's, you know, he, he doesn't have any juice anymore. And that running game is not, you don't run with a running game that, to set up the pass when it's, a, you know, a third string quality running back as your top running back. It's going to be all on Dak's shoulders, which means it's going to be on CD Lamb's shoulders. And CD Lamb from the bye week on was far and away the number one receiver. And the, again, this also should have you asking about Dak Prescott because he was the number two quarterback, barely behind Josh Allen, who had a prodigious, ridiculous run of rushing touchdowns that may not be replicated. So you right. can say, hey, Dak Prescott is poised maybe to be the number one quarterback. You can get him as the eighth or ninth quarterback right now. Yeah, value, bargain. Uh, let's wrap up today's show talking about MHJ, Marvin Harrison Jr., who could be big. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying 2,000 big, but and, and don't fall for the rookie wide receiver. Like, okay, some take time. Some receivers take three years. Right. Marvin Harrison could take three seconds. Third play of his career goes for a touchdown. Yeah. Write it down. Right. Yeah, I think that the – path for and Marvin Harrison Jr. going around the same part of the draft as Drake London and look as a quick aside you know burying the lead here the lead is I feel like see, there's not really any second round quality like classic second round quality wide receivers in fantasy drafts so we're just taking the top of the third round tier guys like London and Harrison and they're getting into the second round because of that strange landscape because the drop off from like Puka Nakua and Garrett Wilson to Marvin Harrison Jr. and Drake London. Not that London and Harrison can't get there, but it's aspirational. You're drafting them at their ceiling. You're saying, we hope that Marvin Harrison is going to catch, say, 100, 110 balls to 1,200, 1,300 yards. Just what DeAndre Hopkins did before with Kyler Murray when everything lined up. You know, Kyler Murray has showed us, yeah, he'll, he'll just lean on somebody, and that's fine by him. And Marvin Harrison has that kind of game with separation, with catch radius, with catch point. Where you know I mean, Michael Wilson's interesting, and Kyler Murray saying some good things about him. Isn't it great, by the way, as an aside, cease that Kyler's talking to the media now? I wonder what the deal is with that. But then you know now you're there, he he's getting a chance to show his personality. And I think it's likable. I mean he he's a likable guy, and you can see that a lot of the stuff that about the video games and all of that stuff totally overblown. And I don't think his teammates ever bought into any of that. I think his teammates know who he is. So you, you like Kyler. Marvin Harrison can live up to this, but there can be some rookie bumps in the road. And also there's a guy, Trey McBride, that Kyler showed. I can just throw to him. I'll throw to him 12 times if I have to. You know, just whoever's getting it done that day could see a lot of targets. Yeah, could see a lot of targets, could see a lot of fantasy points for your fantasy team. And that's why you check out footballguys.com. We are here to help you. We're the guide. You're the hero. Speaking of hero running backs, you're the hero. We're the guide. It's footballguys.com. Sign up for our free daily newsletter every morning, hot and fresh to your inbox. All the news you need to know every single day. It's Bob Harris, Cecil Lammy, third person, Sigmund Bloom, and Joe Bryant. It's our Football Guys free daily newsletter. Come get a taste at footballguys.com. He's Sigmund Bloom. You follow him on Twitter X at Sigmund Bloom. So ridiculous. I have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm at Cecil Salami. The show is at the Audible. Everyone, thanks for watching. Watch these other videos right here and stay tuned and stay frosty. 